Hello, hello everyone. Good morning, buenos dias. This is such a big day for Autumn, especially for me. I am Patty Sesma, Vice President of Marketing and Communications. Oh my God, today is a big day. Like I was saying, we have an Autumn talk that is just out of this world, literally out of this world. We are going to be speaking with Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz. And before I actually bring him to the screen and so that uh, you guys can start asking questions as well, I want to make an introduction about a little bit of the things that he that have made him in his career so big. And as a Hispanic or Latina, I'm so proud to be able to have this conversation with him. But I'm going to jump in directly to the facts that I want to share with you guys. Um, so Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz is the first Costa Rican and Hispanic astronaut. He, um, his parents sent him from Costa Rica to Connecticut to live with some relatives, and this happened in 1967. He earned a bachelor's degree in 1973 in mechanical engineer, and this happened at the University of Connecticut. And he earned a doctorate at, in 1977 in applied plasma physics from MIT. He was chosen for NASA in 1980, and he made seven space flights. This is big. His first mission was abroad the Space Shuttle Columbia. Another, sh another uh, shuttle flight included the Atlantis mission, which deployed the Galileo spacecraft that ex um, explored Jupiter. And then another flight is the Endeavor, and he actually participated in a spacewalk here. So without further ado, I'm going to bring him on so that he can tell us everything about his career. And let's just jump in. Hi, Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz. So excited to be here with you today. Surreal, like I just said. How are you today? I'm doing fine, Patty. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much. So Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz has allowed his new friends to call him Franklin. So that is how I'm going to be addressing him. Uh, so I don't want you guys to think that I'm just very relaxed in the conversation. I'm not. I'm very nervous, but I'm so excited. <laughs> uh, if you guys have any questions during the live, please feel free to add those in our comments. And we'll be um, adding those at the like with it, uh, among the um, during our conversation. But I do have a lot of questions, so I want to jump right in. Um, Franklin, um, first question, and I'm pretty sure you have answered this a million times. But what about space exploration picked your interest the most when you aspired to be an astronaut when you were little, when you were a baby or a child? Yes. Well, you know, Patty, that was. Um... It was a different time, you know, um, 1957, you know, that's a long time ago. Um, that was the opening of the, of, of the space age uh, with the, the first uh, artificial satellite that was ever launched into space. And it was done mm -hmm. by the, the then uh, the Soviet Union, what, we, what yes. used to be called the Soviet Union. And um, before that, um, all the young kids, uh, you know, my age, I was seven years old at the time. Uh, we all kind of thought about space as, um, you know, science fiction. You know, we, 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 we listened to the radio and we uh, read, um, you know, comic books and also um, science fiction stories. Uh, about going to the moon and about uh, going to other planets, and you know, this was this was something that was uh, um, the stuff of dreams for little kids, right? Yeah, and so you know, when it actually happened, when the when the the, the, the first uh, artificial satellite happened, everything sort of became uh, real. Yeah, <laughs> it was it wasn't uh, science fiction anymore, and um, and then. A few years later, um, the first astronauts came, you know, were selected. First, uh, the first um, uh, astronaut was a, a, called a cosmonaut. A cosmonaut uh, was uh, Yuri Gagarin. He was uh, the first uh, human being to, to ever fly into space. And, you know, yes. after that, um, the Americans um, selected seven astronauts and they, they were called astronauts because they wanted to be different from the Soviet Union because there was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of that uh, cold, yeah. uh, cold War going on. And, yes. and so we had um, uh, astronauts like uh, Alan Shepard and uh, Wally Shira and uh, John Glenn and all those uh, uh, 
you know, young um, um, uh, astronauts who became um, our heroes. And that is what I think cemented my path to try to follow that, uh, you know, that, that, that route. Um, rather unlikely because I, you know, I was a young boy growing up in Costa Rica, you know, Costa Ricans <laughs> didn't even have a, an air force or a, even a military force. Um, so it was kind of unusual to think uh, that I would do it, but then, you know, I, I stuck with it and eventually I got there. But Franklin, you are like the perfect example. And I'm speaking here and voicing out a lot of the feelings from the Hispanic community and other global majority uh, communities. But um, in my own experience, you are the, the perfect example of if you really want it, you can get it, right? I read, please correct me if I'm wrong or, um, or unprecise, but I read that you actually were growing in Costa Rica and then your parents wanted you to come into the United States and have a, um, a career here. Is it true that you came in with only $50 in your pocket? Yeah, that is true. Um, oh my know, God. Our, family, our family was not a wealthy family. Uh, we were sort of middle, middle class type working family. Uh, I did um, benefit from a very good education in, in Costa Rica. I went to a uh, a, a, a private um, a Catholic uh, uh, school throughout my entire schooling from first grade all the way through high school. And I got a really good education. But other than that, uh, as soon as um, high school was over, uh, we were supposed to go to work and find our way. And of course, I went to work in a bank. I went to work in the National Bank of Costa Rica that was my first job, <laughs> and my my job uh, at the bank was to um, to change uh, to exchange uh, dollars into the local currency. That was my job, and wow. I, I worked in that bank for about a year, saved uh, about fifty dollars, uh, and I convinced my my dad to buy me a, a ticket to the United States, and he did. But he gave me only a one way ticket. <laughs> He said, I give you the one way ticket because I, I, I know that if I give you um, the return ticket, you'll be, uh, you'll be back here uh, before we know it because it is going to be really tough. It's uh, not going to be easy, correct? <laughs> it's not going to be easy. And he knew it and he was very wise. And I can tell you, Patty, if I had had that return ticket, I would have come back. Yes. I would have yes. given up. It was really, really hard. Absolutely, so, but I'm pretty sure it has pardon? paid off, right? Pardon? I'm pre yeah, I'm pretty sure that you would have like used that return ticket, but thankfully you yeah. didn't. I mean, I love right. your dad. It was like a smart choice and very wise decision. And, and wise. I'm pretty sure it has paid off. Actually, <clears throat> okay, a boy from Costa Rica is dreaming about space, playing around with uh, cardboard boxes, playing like he's in a rocket ship with his friends. And then time, like you grow up, you work in a bank, you convince your dad to send you to Connecticut. How does the, how does the, like getting it real, like how does the path to becoming an astronaut start? Yeah. Like yeah. what, in which part of your life you're like, okay, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to be an astronaut. Yeah. How does that yeah. happen? Well, it, it's not, there, there is no straight line. I mean, clearly, okay. um, you know, I, I, I could not say, you know, here I am in Connecticut. I just arrived with 50 bucks uh, and I'm now going to be an astronaut. <laughs> that, that, was, that was not that was not a realistic, uh, a realistic thing. But, you know, I think... Franklin, sorry to interrupt you, but I, that's a very important thing you said, because a lot of people think that dreaming like is enough for us to achieve dreams. And it's not like that. And you just mentioned that. No, it's not right. That's right. It's a collection. It's a collection of steps, and, and this is this is the way my life has has always been. It's just a collection of small steps. Um, you know, not all of them in the same direction. Sometimes, you know, a little skewed to one side. You know, so it's the path has been you know sort of convoluted and and a lot of a, a lot of turns and 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 um, but. Uh, generally, it has been in the same direction. I, see, so I have kept 
I have kept the general direction uh, pretty, pretty steady. But um, I've taken a lot of turns. And in fact, I can tell you one thing that uh, when I got to Connecticut uh, in 1968, um, it was in the middle of the Vietnam War and it was uh, in the middle of the um, extremely, you know, um, uh, turmoil that was going on in the America, in the U.S. Uh, due to the civil rights movement and the, the um, assassination of Martin Luther King and the assassination of Robert Kennedy and the, the, the demonstrations against the, against the war. And so I got wrapped up into all of that. Uh, there was a lot of, um, a lot of change happening in, in the society. And amongst all of those things that were going on, uh, humans, Americans landed on the moon. And, and that was incredible to see a country that was nearly tearing itself apart, in, 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 you know, socially speaking, Mm -hmm. But at the same time, achieving this, the, the, you know, the pinnacle of technology, landing humans on the, on the moon. And everyone who is about my age uh, remembers um, when uh, Neil Armstrong uh, stepped on the moon. Uh, the whole country became frozen to that moment. And I think the whole world became frozen to that moment. And um, so for me... Uh, I felt, well, look, I'm a little bit closer to my goal, right? I'm, at least I'm in the right country, uh, uh, and, but there's still a long, a long ways to go. And, um, and it turns out that uh, a couple of years afterwards, um, uh, President Nixon canceled the space program, and uh, the Apollo moon program was shut down. And I remember my, uh, my professors at the University of Connecticut, where I was going to school, said, Franklin, um, don't even think about, you know, going into, in, into aerospace uh, because you'll never get a job. And that's because there were thousands of aerospace engineers who had been uh, laid off from NASA because of the, 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 the moon program had been shut down. And so, you know, I'm glad I didn't listen to them. Um, <laughs> So I said, well, uh, I'm just going to have to take a little turn here and go in a little different direction. I, you know, I went into the, the field of nuclear energy and mm -hmm. uh, nuclear engineering and, 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 and eventually thermonuclear fusion. And that's what I, led me to MIT. And, but, you know, I almost forgot about the space program for, for several years until the space shuttle program became alive in 1977. So wow. you can see there was a, there was a big hiatus there okay. uh, where I was doing something entirely different um, and, and almost forgot about the space program. It was different, but in a way it was also necessary for you to learn about because it complemented actually your, your whole career. And this is something that, again, I keep thinking about so many people that are aiming high and they want to become yeah touch the stars with their own hands but also they're thinking about becoming something and they sometimes feel it's unreachable in our organization frankly um austin urban technology movement is it's dedicated 100 to bridging the gap between the technology industry and the black and hispanic communities because we do see a lot of people with dreams of working in tech but they don't have the the um the skills or the uh, just the education. And, and just recently we learned that with the Hispanic communities, I personally learned this, um, a lot of the many, or one of the most important causes um, for Hispanic or Latino kids that really hesitate to, to follow a career in tech since early years is because in their households, they actually tell them like, oh my God, just stop dreaming. Please forget about those types of jobs. Come on, become a whatever, like study business administration, something really quick so you can help the family with their own business or things like that, right? So that is when you're talking about, yes, um, my path wasn't a straight line. My path had, there's like a hiatus or there is like, sometimes you go on a different route, but if it's actually something that is meant for you and it's like 
in your is your dream and it's on your heart, you're gonna get back to it. Like sometimes you just need yeah. to take different uh, paths, right? Yeah, I think eventually that's that's right. You 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 tend to gravitate towards okay. uh, what you like, and you know I think it's important to um, to, to to realize that um, that you need to you need to aim not for what you see, but what what will be. Not 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 what you eat, well, you know what what is right now, but what will be that you, you need to lead uh, that target because it's a moving target. You cannot shoot for a target that you see at the moment. You need to see. You need to shoot for the target that will will the target will be you know years from now when you get there. So so it, it's, it's 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 important to like if you see the world as it is today um, and you are in your say your early 20s um, the world in, in you know, when you be in your when you get to be your 30s um, it will be a, a different world and, and and you need to aim for that world not for the world that you see today and i think the pandemic taught us how to think like that because in my personal experience people didn't really like for example, small businesses didn't really know how to use Facebook or Instagram or social media. And March 2020, they were like, I need to learn it like right now so I can do something on Friday. So I think that we are starting to believe that things are not going to remain as they are right now. And yes, mm -hmm. we need to focus on I'm going to work for this because later in life it may evolve. It will evolve, actually. That's so right. going back to um your initial steps how does it happen like what's happened between you were in college and doing the um um studying for the nuclear sorry right. the name okay yeah mm -hmm. and right. then uh and then later just being chosen by nasa to join their program and start um prep uh preparing yourself and in in training to become an astronaut right yeah, um, that's, that, that was, uh, you know, um, an interesting um, confluence of things because I was working in the, in the, in the uh, fusion program at, at, uh, at MIT, fusion mm -hmm. being, being a form of nuclear energy, nuclear power. Nuclear power was very uh, popular uh, in the 70s. Um, and then, of course, we had this, uh, major accidents uh, at the, you know, reactors that, that that had problems at Three Mile Island, and there was a, a, a major accident, a nuclear accident in uh, Chernobyl in, in in Russia, and then and more more recently the <clears throat> the Japanese uh, Fukushima uh, uh, reactor failure. But all in all. Um, you know, nuclear power uh, continued to be, in my mind, a very important uh, player in the energy matrix of the world. And I, I really feel today that, um, you know, all this discussion about uh, climate change and, and global warming and all these problems that are coming to the world as a result of the way we burn uh, fossil fuels are going to bring nuclear power back into the front stage. And, and I also felt at the time that nuclear power was extremely important to get us to Mars, to get us to the outer planets, because the sun, uh, when, you, when you're far away, as far away as, as Mars or, or other planets beyond, the sun is just too feeble, too, too weak, uh, and it will not be sufficient to to power your, your ship. So mm -hmm. ships in, in the future, as, as the way I thought, we're going to need nuclear power. And, um, and so, you know, I studied nuclear, nuclear uh, energy. And then in 1977, NASA began the uh, testing of the space shuttle program. And the space shuttle began to, you know, it, it was on TV, uh, you know, all of a sudden, um, it was real. Uh, it had, you know, it had almost woken up. It had been, a space program had been uh, asleep for many years and then all of a sudden it woke up. 
And so, um, who, for who some actually reason, reactivated, who actually they, reactivated the program? Who actually re, uh, you said Nathan actually shut it down, but who reactivated the program? It was reactivated uh, in the uh, Jimmy Carter uh, years, uh, okay. but even even before that, uh, um, there, there was you know the the program was not really dead. It was it was really no, uh, kind of in a in a in a very low mode, uh, uh, kind of preparing and preparing and preparing you know, uh, out of the radar. And then all of a sudden the, the space shuttle was built yes. and now it was time to test it. And when it came out uh, in the in, in the TV, uh, everybody was, was able to see this gigantic bird, you know, that uh, that was uh, being taken from the back of a 747 and, and dropped in the middle of the air and it was able to fly. And this was going to be our new, our new uh, spaceship. And um, what happened was that NASA um, issued a, um, an announcement uh, in 1977 uh, that it was looking for a new group of astronauts. And, and for the first time in NASA's um, you know, astronaut uh, program, they were looking for scientists. Um, and they were looking for young, you know, scientists uh, who also, you know, were in really good physical shape and, you know, had all the trappings of an astronaut. But they were also, uh, be they began to bring in the diversity um, uh, that, that you see today in the astronaut program. And, um, and heck, I, obviously, all of the astronauts need, needed to be American citizens. And I had become an American citizen in, in 1977. So um, I had all the pieces that, you know, all of a sudden I found myself, I had a, you know, they were looking for scientists with a PhD. I had a PhD. I was young. I was in good shape. You know, I, I, I was a U.S. citizen. And hey, you know, I had all the pieces uh, that were needed. I'm hearing. <laughs> so, so I applied, but, but, but see, I applied, I applied in that group and I was rejected. Oh, um, God. Like, uh, like right away, right away I was rejected. And I, I figured, well, I mean, there were thousands of people who applied, so, you know, uh, what the heck, I'm sure that eventually there'll be a, another group, that they will be looking for another group and so on. I said, well, um, no problem. I'll just, uh, you know, bite my time. And it turns out that I was right. Uh, within a couple of years, uh, NASA issued another uh, uh, call for another group of astronauts because they didn't have enough with the ones that they had selected in 1970, uh, seventy-eight. And so I just uh, opened my files, took out my old application, kind of <laughs> updated it, <laughs> sent it over to NASA. I had already, you know, experience as, a, as an investigator, as a, as a scientist, and, and I, I was still in good shape and everything. Um, and this time they, they called me. Wow. They, this time they called me and I, I was, I was um, asked to come to, to Houston for an interview and and a battery of tests and uh, that was uh, I had made the cut from you know I think it was about 3,000 people who had applied wow. to about 120 finalists and um, or semi-finalists and out of the 120 I went I went in, in one of the groups um, went through all the battery of tests and uh, the interviews and and they looked me over and all that. And in May of, um, of 1980, I got a call from NASA saying I was I had been selected. Oh, I God. was uh, one of 19. Uh, you know, I was one of 19 uh, uh, astronauts, and I was the first Latino to ever be selected. And you know, it was completely changed my life at that moment. Um, so, so we we need to stop there. How does that day 
like what happened on that day like what time do you get the call was it like please tell me everything about that day how do yeah. you tell your parents like hey i'm going into space like how does that happen <laughs> <laughs> well it was a really crazy day because uh i had forgotten all about uh, the fact that i had applied that, that you know i had been in the in the in the semi-finalist because you know several months had, had, had gone by it turns out that in that period of time, I had been working on the development of a new plasma rocket engine, which is, it turns out that that's what I'm doing right now, right? I'm working on this rocket engine. Uh, but at the time I was just starting to think about how to build this um, uh, new you know, plasma rocket engine. And I was, uh, I had requested an interview with uh, one of the top um, uh, scientists at MIT, uh, Professor uh, Eugene Covert, uh, who was the head of the gas turbine laboratory at MIT. And he was a big shot. You know, he had a gigantic office in the middle of the institute. And I was just a young kid, you know, with a few charts and there, there were no <laughs> PowerPoint presentations in those days because we didn't have PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were and using light cards. <laughs> I, was, I was using uh, view graphs, you know, actual pieces of plastic with the scribbles and you have to put it on a projector. Projector. And yeah. And so I requested a, a, an audience with Professor Covert and I, you know, I went into his office, which was a gigantic office, you know, and I was just sitting there with my charts, talking to, to the guy who was behind this gigantic desk. And um, somehow in the middle of our conversation, he gets a phone call and he picks up the phone and he talks and uh, it's, it's something, I don't know, I, I just kind of, I was just quiet. And then he says, uh, it's for you. Oh my and God. For me. <laughs> so, so I stood up, walked over to his desk, grabbed the phone, and it was uh, uh, George Abbey, um, who I didn't know who George Abbey was, but he was the head of the astronaut program at NASA. And he was telling me that I had been selected in the group of astronauts, in that, of this uh, new, new group of astronauts. And I, I thought it was a joke, because <laughs> MIT, at MIT, they're, they're, they're notorious for these kinds of jokes. You know, they play jokes on you. So I thought that my friends at MIT were playing a joke on me because they, they all knew that I had applied to the program and stuff. So I grabbed the phone and finally, I began to, to think that perhaps this was true. <laughs> and, and I got really extremely nervous. Oh my God. And, and began, began to, Pace back and forth with the phone, but you know, in those days, in those days, we didn't have wireless phones. We had the phones had an actual, <laughs> an actual <laughs> spiral thing, cord. A spiral cord, and somehow I, I managed to wrap this cord around Professor Cobb's <laughs> neck, <laughs> and he was struggling with. Oh my God, that is so funny! <laughs> and um, <clears throat> somehow. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Abby on the other on the other on the other end said, uh, "Well, you you know, do you do you want the job? I mean, he asked me <laughs> he asked me the question. Do you accept the job? And, you know, I I I had a hard time saying yes. You know, I had to, you know something that I had pursued my entire life. Um, somehow oh it's hard for me to to even utter the word yes, and." And then he said, well, look, um, <clears throat> just give us a call, you know, within the next 30 minutes, because we got to make an, a, a press release. And if you, you know, if you're not interested, we're going to give the job to the next person. Oh and, my God. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, like you and need some said, time. And, to about it. and uh, why don't you call me at this number? And he started to give me a number and I didn't have anything to write with. So I grabbed, um, I grabbed the ripped off a piece of paper from Professor Covert's uh, uh, <laughs> desk, uh, you know, notebook and took out his pen from his coat pocket and, 
and, and right over him and wrote down the number. And anyway, you can imagine the state, the state of mind. But I, I did, I, I did say uh, yes, absolutely. I do want the job. I oh accept positively. I do accept this job. And, you were uh, able to bring it out. So <laughs> what day was that? Do you well, remember what day? That was that was uh, May May thirty first, I think, in nineteen eighty. Okay. And okay. Um, and so then fin finally, I hang out the phone and I said, Professor Covert, I I I I've just been selected as an astronaut. <laughs> and he said he said, uh, Yeah, I know, because it turns <laughs> out it turns out that he was a good friend of um, George Abbey, who was the head of the astronaut. Oh. He, they, they knew each other from way back from the Apollo days. And, and anyway, he said, well, Franklin, listen, um, I think your rocket engine can wait. And uh, let me be the first one to congratulate you and um, go and celebrate. <laughs> so I took off and I ran out. And in the, in the process of going back to my work at Draper Labs, which is across the street, um, I almost got run over by a taxi cab. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, please. <laughs> so it was a pretty amazing day. Oh, my God, Franklin. Uh, I'm so touched and moved. What a story. And I really hope that all that you're telling us right now is going to inspire others to do what in Spanish we say or we call no quitar el dedo del renglón, which means just keep doing what you're dreaming of. Like you said, you need to focus on on the ultimate goal, not not on the immediate goal. But oh my God, you had me in tears because I got so emotional about it. This is so exciting. So okay, and you 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 become an astronaut. What happens when you're like on your first mission and you are able to look down and see how far you are from your planet? Like, what's the feeling? It, and actually, I want to ask you that. What's like the first thing you can think of when you are in that in that place? And also, is the feeling in the first flight the same as in the sixth flight? Is or does it change? How does that? How does that yeah. happen? Like, yeah, well, it changes. Yeah, it changes over time. Um, to me, it's more like uh, when you learn how something that tastes tastes really good. Um, that you really like to, to, to eat and you savor the flavors. Um, and the more you, you taste it, um, the more flavors that come out and the, the, that you are able to appreciate more. Okay. The first time that you fly in space is like drinking from a fire hose. You know, just everything is coming at you so fast and so it is so powerful. And, you know, you just, you, you, it's hard to take it all in. As you get um, more um, experience as an astronaut and you fly more, you learn to appreciate things better, to uh, understand the medium where you are better and to enjoy it even more. So for me, um, uh, it, it got better and better every time I flew. But um, yes. first time I flew, um, you know, the one thing I wanted to do was, as soon as we got into space, uh, was to look out the window. I mean, <laughs> I wanted to see what it looked like. <laughs> I wanted to see what it looked like out, out, the, out the window. And, and I tell you, that, that, that view of the Earth um, is something that uh, is indescribably beautiful. You know, it's like the most beautiful thing you ever saw. And, and uh, it really completely transforms you because you know that you're not looking at a picture. You're looking at the real thing, you know, at the real thing. If and anything, the, more, the pictures are gonna come from you. <laughs> yeah, the more, that's right. And the more you look, the more you see. Um, somehow the eye, if you know what you're looking at, the eye seems to integrate all the information that's coming in and your brain begins to build so you you, you start seeing things that are more um, more faint and and you de de detect things like um structures and and even you can even see you can even see ships um in the ocean you can see you can see all kinds of things 
um, because somehow you know they're there. And all you got to do is really concentrate. And, and it's amazing what the, the eye can, can detect. That's unbelievable. Like you literally took us on that trip right now. Um, so let me ask you this. As um, becoming a, a Latino, the first Latino astronaut, what were like the main challenges you have to face if there were any challenges just because of you being a Latino? Uh, and, and this is, um, I really want people to understand that challenges are in every career, in every single path we decide to take, not necessarily in what, uh, in this specific conversation uh, of aerospace, but they are going to find challenges everywhere. So I want to know and I want to yeah. uh, understand if you were, um, if you actually had to face any challenges just for becoming yeah. the first Latino astronaut. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, from the from the inside, there were challenges because uh, you know we were uh, the first, uh, maybe the first people of color that uh, were in the program, and all of those um, uh, sort of prejudices that that uh, some of them are you know, strong, others are more, more um, subtle, and th these things are still there, and, and they were very much there, and people, e even though they were all very, very, you know, cordial and very nice to, to me, I think I was expected to uh, perform, maybe uh, kind of to prove myself, um, maybe more, more so than, than, than a, a white uh, a white person. Um, be that as it may, I was not worried about that. You know, I, I felt completely comfortable and, and able to handle the, the, the workload and, and do even better than, than others. And I was, I, I, I couldn't say that I was the best, but I couldn't, I wouldn't say that I was the worst. I was, you know, a regular, normal, you know, astronaut, and um, and I think the proof of that is that I did get assigned to many flights. So that was a, a, a big, of, a bit of a surprise to me that I ended up flying more than anybody else for some reason. Uh, at this moment, uh, it, it, I, I I hold the record for the most uh, flights of any any human being. Um, of any nation, uh, along with uh, uh, one of my um, astronaut uh, mates, uh, who happens to be white. So uh, <clears throat> you know, we we I just felt that um, that despite of the fact that people were um, uh, confused a little bit about where you know where I came from. Many people uh, within NASA thought that I was from Puerto Rico uh, instead of Costa Rica, because Costa Rica was not a very well-known uh, country at the time. Now it is because, you know, all the tourism and all of that. But, uh, mm -hmm. but in 1980, you know, a lot of people in the astronaut program didn't really know the difference between Costa Rica and Puerto Rico. And so, yeah. But, yeah, so that's fine. Um, so that's on the inside. On the outside, the the thing that that I was unprepared for was um, the the sort of no notoriety that came along with being the first Latino. You know, there was a lot of people that were looking up to me, and I had a really um, I, w I had not I had not prepared myself for that. <laughs> I was, you know I, I was not. Um, I was not, um, uh, you know, ready or prepared to be a role model. Uh, I mean, I had a lot of role models myself, but I was not thinking of me being a yeah. role model for somebody else. And that uh, really hit me, uh, particularly with the young people. And uh, certainly when I came back to Latin America and, uh, you know, certainly Costa Rica, other countries that I visited, uh, all that notoriety was difficult for me because I tend to be a, a rather shy person. You know, I, I don't, I'm not a, you know, um, um, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not much of a, an extrovert. Um, but uh, I guess I managed to, to deal with it. And um, 
the most important thing to me is that never ever um, uh, you know turn the other way when a young uh, child um, wants my my photograph or an autograph or some kind of anything mm -hmm. uh, because if that had happened to me when I was little uh, that an astronaut would have given yeah. me a cold shoulder I, it would have been devastating for me yeah so to I, a point I, where you I actually think, can shut down your dream yeah it could so yeah it's one of the things that I worry the most about it's oh. about uh, for just whatever reason maybe I'm I may be too tired. I may be just completely, you know, um, extremely, uh, you know, saturated with, yeah, uh, with, with, with with people's uh, attention. Um, I cannot, uh, uh, I cannot hurt a young, a young, a young boy or a young girl who, who wants just a simple smile or uh, just an autograph or a photograph. I will do it even if I'm dying, <laughs> so, so, because I, uh, you know, that way it would be devastating for some of these uh, young youngsters. That's beautiful that you say that because yes, something as tiny as that can become the the main factor or ingredient in encouraging them to becoming something like you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, and and then it becomes part of their story. Like I met uh, an astronaut when I was little, and this actually projected me to what I'm doing right now because it meant so much to me. And I actually want to touch on something. I ask you this question and I really want an answer. How did you tell your parents I'm going into space? And I want to know also, I know that you were uh, talking, I don't know if it was a president of Costa Rica, but from outer space. So how does that happen in Costa Rica? Like you became a celebrity. Um, the, the president contact you, how, how does that happen? Yes, that's that's exactly what happened. Well, for with, with my parents, you know, as soon as I got over all the, the uh, you know, all the, the, the confusion and the and the uh, <laughs> excitement of that one of the day of the of the afternoon uh, in Boston, I, I picked up the phone and I called my my parents in Costa Rica, uh, and you know, the first person I talked to was my my father, who who actually you know couldn't say anything he just started crying oh. he started crying and and he he said i gotta i gotta give the phone to your mother because i just can't talk and my my mom of course she went you know ballistic i mean she was uh she was so excited you know my mom is a very um ex expressive and very extroverted person that, and she just uh, huh sorry how do you break the news? Like, how do you say something like that to them? Yeah, I told her, I you know, I, 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 I've been selected as an astronaut. They, they knew that I was pursuing this. Okay. Oh, okay. they, yeah. My, my mom knew that I wanted to do this all my life. She had always encouraged me to do this, to follow it. Uh, she didn't believe that I was going to reach that goal. <laughs> ne neither did my father, but they never said, "Don't try." Yeah. They uh, they encouraged me to try to keep trying until I just couldn't try anymore, and and so um, so it was a it was like 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 fire like wildfire that spread it spread it very quickly in Costa Rica. The newspapers. She my mom called the newspapers, and of course uh, they never they didn't believe her. <laughs> so that is so she was very she was very frustrated because um, she had called all the newspapers and they didn't believe her. And they had to wait for the official uh, uh, NASA communi communique that came out uh, yeah. that afternoon. Um, That's so funny. To, 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 to truly believe <laughs> that she was telling the truth. Um, oh my God. So, yeah. That is amazing. I mean, I just, I can imagine what that looked like for them. And again, touching on, if um, kids or or just youth um, and even older people, like everyone, has a dream, the first place where they they need to feel that assurance is from their own heads or family, right? Because that's actually something that um, could just propel them to become what they want or not. Like we were just talking uh, a moment ago. Let me um, talk a little bit about uh, you becoming the first Latino astronaut. Is something that is just, I mean, personally to me, it is just amazing. Uh, how do you see the space 
industry, space tech, space exploration, everything related to space. How do you see this industry evolving in, ter in yeah. terms of diversity and inclusion? Right, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very good question uh, there, Patty, because uh, as I said before, you need to target not what, for what you see, but, but what will be. And yeah. what will be is very different from what you see today. And you, you already begin, you're beginning to see the change even now. Um, the, the, the space um, industry is going to become um, uh, ex extremely private. Uh, it's going to be a tremendous amount of private activity because space really is a natural extension of humanity. And Correct. space is, is a place of business, a place of, of, uh, of actual work. Um, it's not just a place that you go uh, to explore, although we will have the exploration still going on. There's always going to be the frontier. But <clears throat> what's happening is now the private sector is getting into this game. And yes. when the private sector gets into this, the game, uh, now the profit, the, the profit motive is a very strong driver for everything. Money, mm -hmm. there is money to be made. Uh, there is opportunity to, to be had. And, and, and space is going to become um, democratized. Um, it's not going to be just uh, the two nations that uh, began all of this uh, back in the 60s, uh, you know, the US and the Soviet Union, but now it's going to be a worldwide uh, effort with astronauts coming from all over the world. Um, many astronauts will be just private astronauts um, and they will be going to space for a reason not just to have a, you know, to have fun. Um, right now, there's a lot of that. Uh, a lot of bil billionaires uh, spending their money to uh, just uh, have, have this, the, you know, the ultimate uh, junket. Um, you know, th the way I see it, and this is what I'm trying to do with uh, our company, is that we're building an infrastructure so that humans can, um, project and propagate and expand into space because the, the planet Earth is, is not going to be able to sustain uh, the, the weight of humanity, um, the full weight of yeah. humanity. In the mid-century, you know, you, you'll be there, I won't, but um, and, and, you know, certainly your children will see uh, the 22nd century. Um, and the planet will be a different place. Uh, and if we are, you know, growing in the pace that we're growing and doing what we're doing to our environment, we're not going to have a very pleasant place to, to be here on this planet. Yeah. It's going to be 10, 10 billion people that, are, that need to be... Uh, have good lives and and that's not possible um, given the, the rate of destruction that we're doing with our environment. So, okay. so we need to um, first uh, take care of our planet now and enable humanity to move out, not to, not to, not to abandon the earth, but to preserve the earth. Uh, yes. as, you know, I often say as a national park, uh, the earth will be um, humanity's national park, uh, a protected area for humans to always come back to see how beautiful it is, you know, where we all came from. But <clears throat> most of humanity will be really um, living and, and growing out elsewhere in, in, in space. So, so th this is really the future and this is what young people need to be paid. So, would you say that is like the ultimate goal of the Ad Astra Rocket Company? Yes, ultimately, Ad Astra Rocket Company wants to enable that um, outward movement uh, okay. with pr propulsion systems, with rockets that are able to really go fast, um, to really go deep into space. Uh, 
these are rockets like no other rocket that you've ever seen. You know, these are plasma, electric plasma engines. They're not chemical rockets like we see them today uh, and completely revolutionize the way we travel in space wow. because the distances are very long, very yeah. big distances. And we cannot be going to uh, cover those distances with the, the current uh, propulsion systems we have. So, okay. So that, you know, that that's so really what I'm trying to do. Yeah. So, so interesting that you say that because, and the way you explain it, Franklin, is so easy to understand. You actually took me to the very time where I was at a roller coaster on Disney that was actually propulsion, and I hated it. So I just can't imagine <laughs> what that's going to look like. Um, but Okay, you talked a lot. You talk about private com companies becoming um, interested in space exploration. We just recently had another autumn talk with three journalists from Austin Inno, Dallas Business Journal, and Houston Inno, and they were talking to us about how the space race runs through Texas. They wrote an article that is titled like that. That's the title of the uh, article, and we learned about all the companies that are moving into Texas to start endeavoring the space exploration. So what are your, th I mean, you already told us like you think that is something necessary, but what what's the position of like, how's that gonna look for NASA? Having a lot of private companies coming into doing their own thing, how does that lead NASA? Well, NASA, NASA is going to be a player, uh, but it's not gonna be the only player. Uh, okay. And you know, um, this is, this is a game that um, ha has a lot of people now able to play the game. And NASA is going to have to um, adapt and, um, and play the game uh, along with everybody else. Uh, it's not just NASA. Um, it, it may be that NASA continues to push the envelope, uh, you know, push the, uh, the uh, frontier and, mm -hmm. and not worry so much about uh, the near earth um, um, activities, but maybe concentrate more on deep space, uh, you know, Mars, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and so on, uh, develop the technologies that will enable humans to, to do that. But other countries are going to play as well. I mean, the Chinese are very deeply involved in, in, in space and they're not gonna go away. So are the Russians and the uh, Japanese and the, the Europeans. And, and now uh, there are many space agencies growing all over uh, uh, the world. Uh, the Uni United Arab Emirates um, have already, they already have a, a, a orbiting spacecraft around Mars. Um, the Chinese have landed um, robots on the moon. They're, they're uh, you know, they have big, big plans. India has a big space program. They already have a uh, spacecraft orbiting uh, the planet Mars. Uh, so, you know, this has become a, a worldwide effort. The technology, thanks to the internet, uh, is now available to everyone. So you can do space technology anywhere you want in the world because you have access to the information. Right. So, so, so you see, uh, space, the chemistry of space is different than it was. And, you know, NASA um, will have to change, will have to evolve into something yes. different. And hopefully yes. that will happen. And, uh, you know, I, I'm hoping that that'll, that'll be the case. If that question were to be asked to me without being so limited in my knowledge about NASA and space exploration, I would just have... I guess the answer would be, I really hope that NASA actually evolves to a point where they can align with what space exploration with private companies are trying to do, because I do see a difference in their um, in their goals. Um, and, and I do think that that is it's way better. Like we have a lot more options to um, to get results from. And actually, this takes me to the next question. Franklin, please talk to us about the Webb telescope. Please tell me. What is the Webb telescope? What are we going to learn from that object? Why has it been like, I think it has been like 10 years that uh, they've been wanting to launch it. And it seems like it's finally going to happen on the 25th, but they can push it back. So we, I, I learned and I've been reading about communication problems, et cetera. But what is exactly the, the big value that the Webb telescope is bringing to us? 
Well, it's going to be located far away from the interference of Earth. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. an important thing. Uh, the Earth, uh, as such, uh, does create uh, interference and and the sun is going to be protected from the sun. So, you know, it's going to be able to to, to peer, to, 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 to look deeper uh, with more precision into um, out into into the farthest reaches of space we are now uh, recognizing that there are thousands and thousands of other planets around uh, uh, other stars and and it may be that um, uh, planets uh, able to harbor life uh, are quite quite numerous uh, and you know obviously they're really far away and uh, and we're going to have to find uh, someday uh, a transportation uh, capability to, to be able to send humans and to have humans visit all those those locations. The good thing uh, is that you're already building that. Well, we're working on we're working definitely on on at least the, the first steps. Um, like like okay. I said before <laughs> at the beginning, we take small steps. Um, yes. We 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 take small steps, but we do uh, we do them fre frequently. So we learn quickly, um, yes. but re in reality, uh, I I believe that uh, the Earth, um, uh, you know, Earth-like planets are probably extremely numerous, um, very common, and I I believe that life uh, outside of our planet is more the norm than than the exception, and that uh, sooner or later we're going to find. Uh, that the um, universe is teeming with life, full of life, and that uh, we are just one of many, and that we're neither that special or, <laughs> you know, we're not that important. Um, we are probably somewhere in the middle. We're not, you know, the most advanced uh, or the least advanced. We're probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And, and also... Um, the universe, uh, the time scale of what things happen in the universe is so long that, uh, you know, humanity could come and go in the blink of an eye in, in the in the time scale of the of the universe. And it doesn't really matter that much, you know, whether humanity is there or not. Um, but it doesn't it matters to us. Right. Yes. <laughs> it matters a lot to us. So we need to find ways to uh, ensure that humanity will survive. That is amazing. Um, Franklin, we do have um, a few minutes left and I, and I do have two questions for you um, to start wrapping up our conversation. If it was me, I would stay here forever. I'm having so much fun and I'm learning so much from you. This is such a pleasant conversation. Let me ask you something. What is one piece, one piece of advice that you would give to individuals from the global majority interested in pursuing a career in tech space or aerospace? I think the most important thing is to take the risk, to not be afraid of failure. I tell people that in my, in my life, most of the things that I did failed. Yeah. Uh, you know, only a few, a few a few cases of things that I tried uh, are actually successful. So you have to be, uh, you know, learn to to fail in order to succeed. Correct. And maybe that is the most important lesson that I have learned to 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 be willing to fail, to be willing to get hurt, uh, to take a risk. Uh, and to uh, accept failure as a lesson so that you can be successful in the next or the, the one after that. So. so to everyone who's going to be viewing right now or is going to be viewing this later, if you want to reach for the stars, you need to learn to take the step and fall and stand up and continue. That's exactly what Franklin yeah. is uh, recommending and it comes from someone who has been successful in reaching the stars and his dreams. And my last question, frankly, this is actually a personal question. It comes from my heart and I really, really want to ask this to you. If you could plant a flag in the moon, 
with a legend from Dr. Frank, Franklin Chang Diaz, what would that legend be? If I could plant, if I could plant a flag in the moon with a legend from Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz, what would that legend be? Well, you know, we're all humans. We all came from this planet that uh, you can see over there, planet Earth, and we're not uh, really. We're not really citizens of any country. We're citizens of a planet. Wow, that's beautiful. I mean, the the aliens may feel bad that you're saying those things because they're gonna feel like you're not taking them into account. But it's fine, right? <laughs> the extraterrestrials. <laughs> oh my God, Franklin! I really have no words to thank you. You made me cry. You made me laugh. This is such a pleasant conversation and I had so much fun and I have such respect for you and what you've done and I really I'm sure that uh what you're working on right now through your company the at Astro Rocket Company is going to go beyond and um please keep us posted because we really want to keep having these conversations with you and keep sending um um information about space and tech space and how and, and how this industry is evolving to all the people that we're actually touching through our mission so Thank you okay. so much for your time. Well, thank you for your, your time, Patty. It's you been great. Have, have a great Go holiday. Ahead. You too. Thank you so much for you and your family. And thank you, everyone, for watching. I'm going to be sharing this um, conversation around social media because it's been so great. So uh, thank you, everyone, for your time. And we'll keep in touch. And stay tuned for our next um, um, talk by Autumn HQ. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. You bet. Bye-bye.